Coming up on today's BMW Motorrad Ride and Talk podcast, helmet design, manufacturing, and the people that work to make it happen. Take a listen. Over the years, I've had the privilege of riding BMW motorcycles all over the world. And the one thing I've come away with is that the only thing more extraordinary than the ride are the people you meet along the way. These are their stories. My name is Sean Thomas, and this is BMW Motorrad's Ride and Talk. The big advantage that we have here is that I can get in contact or involve any specialists, even of the automotive department. You have a lot of great people here, young people, older people, skilled people. When you realize to combine different characters, it's much more than just one plus one. And that's our advantage here. Many years ago, I was taken on a tour of a facility that manufactures BMW helmets, hosted by Udo Wattendorf, part of the helmet development team at BMW. Throughout the day, Udo showed us how BMW helmets are designed, tested, and built. This was easily one of the most fascinating professional experiences I've ever had, not the least of which due to the knowledge and enthusiasm radiated by Udo. Today, Udo remains a key developer of helmets at BMW, and just like so many years ago, he is incredibly knowledgeable, well-spoken, and enthusiastic. My producer, Louise Powers, and I sat down with Udo in Munich to discuss helmet design, the materials used, and the importance of the people that bring concepts to reality. All right, I have a story for you, okay? Okay. I was in Mongolia, and we were riding bikes. This was for the GS Trophy, and I had the GS Carbon helmet on, and it was a really hot day, and we got stuck at a checkpoint, ah. and we had to wait, and we waited for a long time, and I was sitting on the bike, and I was so tired, and, and it was hot, and I... I leaned my head forward and I never noticed until that moment that the peak of my GS carbon helmet mated perfectly with the windscreen cut out on the GS. Like when I leaned my head forward, the perf- there was a perfect seam between the two and I go, that cannot be an accident. That must have been. And it, it got me thinking about this incredible process of design that goes into making a helmet. Yeah. And it is such a huge deal starting way back with a piece of paper and an idea. Can you tell us where it goes from there? Yeah. So, but this is, this was really, really a long-term process hmm. because the peak for a helmet is the most aerodynamically, it's a nightmare. Right. Because everybody It's, it's wears... just like, yeah. well, the peak is just disturbing. Yeah. yeah. Everybody it's that just, rides a, an adventure uh, bike on the highway yeah. with a dual sport helmet knows that feeling of having... It's just a nightmare. So you have to guarantee maximum aerodynamic efficiency. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And this is so interesting because so many manufacturers now, they just make the peak shorter. No. Fine. But then it doesn't do its job when it's That's protecting it. you from the sun. That's it. That's yeah. it. Yeah. And it's enormous force and pressure by wind, mm-hmm. by dry, with driving on the peak yeah. so it has to be stable somehow it may not have any vibrations sure due to the wind and yeah. so this was really really complex and we just tried out because at some point you have to try out you have to print on the 3d printer mm-hmm. you have to print the uh, the peaks and just test them on the road and we are quite lucky here we can use any bike that we want yeah. when i uh, uh. when we have the helmet here as a prototype helmet and um you just go out on the road i, I just have everything that i need all the suits gloves i have everything here yeah. it's over there and i just take my stuff and I just go out with a bike for one or two hours and sure. test the helmet. Sure. Or to a colleague, let's go together to share our impressions and we just test it yeah. on the road. And test the helmet. <laughs> no fun <laughs> at all. <laughs> no fun at all. <laughs> so it, it, it obviously we just yeah. stay out for two hours or three hours or four hours we, when we get lost, when we just oh, get no. lost by discussion yeah. and ideas oh. and just this kind of spin it. I feel, but yeah. this is better. Oh, no. But do you feel this rumor? Ah, okay. And the next time I will have a look on this rumor and just testing it. Yeah. And we are quite happy here in Germany because when we test the peak, mm-hmm. We go full throttle. Sure. It doesn't yeah. make Adabang. sense. Yeah. Okay, Adabang. 120, this is okay. Yeah. What happens at 180? What happens sure. at 200, 205, 210 right. on the GS, on the right. Autobahn? Yeah. We just just go. And of course, it's like that. But yeah. anyway, we just have to test the helmet 
uh, at, in any situation. It's fascinating to look at some of your specs where you see the wind um, carrying over the windscreen of the bike mm-hmm. and then creating the little vortex between the, the bike and the rider and how things like the peak and the vents are all designed to carry air through the helmet. The way it, that air interacts with a GS, it's all integrated and married we together. Do, we do a lot of investigation in simulation in mm-hmm. all the virtual simulation for aerodynamics mm-hmm. and together with the bike. Yeah. yeah. Of course, together with the bike that the helmet is meant to be. I'm not native speaking English, but you understand what I mean? Yes. Yeah. The GS helmet with the GS yeah. bike. Yeah. That's it. And various GS versions. Yeah. Sure. Of course. Of with course. The smaller one some... and the bigger one course, and adventure yeah. and everything like yeah. Because a uh, very enormous influence, of course, is the windshield. Mm. And, but, the helmet has to work in any conditions. Sure. And, and different size riders mm-hmm. too. That's mm-hmm. it. I mean, just the four That's of us sitting absolutely here. absolutely right. Absolutely right. We do, we investigate in a, a, because we have the, the, the big, 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 big advantage that we have here is that I can get in contact or involve any specialists, even of the automotive department. Mm. This is an enormous advantage. Mm. You have a lot of great people here. Mm. Young people, older people, skilled people. It's yeah. super nice here. That's this is this is just Disneyland for a developer here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the wind gallery people, absolutely experts. And of course, if you maybe or very often totally different characters, but when you listen to people and you listen to them by wanting to hear their opinion, mm-hmm. you have one. If you want to discuss with these people. Yeah, and really want to to profit of their knowledge, and it's just involving people with their skills. Mm. This gives you an enormous advantage. And when you when you um, realize to combine different characters, yeah, it's much more than just one plus one, mm. and that's our advantage here. We have the simulation people of the car for of the automotive development we have all the wind galleries that we can mm. use yeah. and these are wind galleries that you can get in with all the bike yeah at a very early state mm-hmm. we sit on the bike in the wind gallery with a printed helmet on it mm. on the bike on a gs or whatever you want just to test the helmet under various conditions yeah in a very very early stage mm. when we first met the system 7 helmet was just at the final stages of Mm -hmm. development. Mm -hmm. And you had this articulating element, you know, where the helmet would lift up, but it wouldn't just lift up on a single hinge. Yeah. It would go up and then over and back and re-click into an upright Mm -hmm. position, which Mm -hmm. was so interesting. I had never seen its equal Mm -hmm. ever. Well, we we did not stop this kinematics Mm-hmm. with the System 7 helmet. We already had it with the System 6 helmet. Mm. But the new was that we combined it with a detachable chin part. Yeah. So the classical movement, we already knew how this works. Yeah. This is not just a rotation movement in one axis. Mm. It's a kinematic with two different axes, and it's just a lever mechanism. That's the chin part comes down mm-hmm. when it's in the up, uplifted yeah. position. It, and this is something that Louise is always yelling at students about when we teach, yeah. is they put their helmets in the upright position and yes. then they ride with it up and they hit a bump and it comes down a little exactly, bit into their eyes. Exactly, exactly. There are several advantages of the, the disadvantages that the movement and the kinematics and the technical solution is very complex. Mm. So it's not done just by, okay, I try it and then go. It's not like that. It's just trying because the shapes get into conflict. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The shell geometry gets into conflict with the movement. And so you have to define right from the start with a design department this kind of technology. Mm. You cannot just at the end of the design process, you cannot say, okay, I will, ah, oh, now I need a chin mechanism that's working like that. Yeah. You have to introduce this mechanism right from the start and discuss all the conflict zones with the design department. And they have to design the surfaces around this technology. Mm. And, and, that, and that's assuming that you're doing a single shape helmet, and, but you're not. 
because System 7 comes in different sizes. Yes, of course, but it's always like that. We have two different helm helmet sizes, mm -hmm. the smaller one yeah. that goes up to 59, mm -hmm. size 59, yeah. and then the bigger one uh, that starts at 60. Mm -hmm up to the end of but, the range. Right. So in the one hand, the helmet size shape is getting bigger, which means the mechanics have to get bigger, but the visor uh, stays the same. So you're having to make some parts of it bigger, but some parts stay the same and they all have to meet together yes. seamlessly. Great, John. You're totally right at this point because uh, we use two helmet shells, mm -hmm. but one visor. Yeah. All of this and you still have hair. I don't have hair and I don't do this. <laughs> <laughs> now, it was... 2015 and yeah, I and I was so. invited yeah. to Italy mm -hmm. to see the manufacturing and I'm stricken when we get there at how the people that work there responded to you. They they came up and gave you big hugs and they were showing you pictures of their kids. Yeah. And it was really special and and I came to understand that there was a bit of background about that. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. Um, it's a bit like I told you before, when you reach the people by heart and by, I don't know the English expression, I'm very sorry, by Wertschätzung. Yeah. Um, it's not a value in terms of money, but it's just when you really get in contact with the people, mm. they you combine yourself with these people. Mm. And we had, during development time, it's a very strong time of growing together yeah and this is somehow even a combination of various people mm. and you get very close somehow yeah. and when i do development i very often ask the workers down in the production lines mm -hmm. about their opinion mm. because they are the first people and the experts of assembling the helmet and when it comes to production to the helmet, they are the first people that tell, they tell you this is not working well. Ah. Virtually, mm -hmm. um, in the CAD, it works perfectly. Sure. But the people with the right understanding are the people down there in the production lines. Sure. And they all know me by name, yeah. of course, because we, 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 we got together. We, yeah. we, we just... We, we combined ourselves somehow. That yeah. was just the situation. And that's why yeah. they just, we hugged when we meet. Mm -hmm. And it's in, in these days, it's the same. We hug when we meet in Italy. Yeah. Yeah. And it never happened to me in any other production. Mm. I don't know where this comes from, but it's, yeah. maybe it's, it was because of this story. Yeah. We hug in America too. Yeah, <laughs> especially, <laughs> especially Sean. We, we don't have this tradition. The, what was fascinating for me being at that factory was that, you know, I've never seen a helmet manufactured. So I assumed it was just, you you know, a bunch of materials are put into a machine and it stamps out a helmet and that's done. And it's so involved and so precise and so many steps. <laughs> Each step is a human hand touching that helmet and working it through. Exactly. That's the main issue. Mm. It's 95% manual work yeah, and you absolutely depend on the enthusiasm and the, the trustability mm. of, of these people. Yeah, And it can be done in various ways. Mm. And that's why it's so important that the people, they identify themselves with the product. Yeah, And it's always very, very nice when you realize how the people are involved in your product. Mm. When I pass by people of production line, they just raise up their hand and say, Udo, come here. Yeah. I just want to show you something. Mm. I am not the employee. Sure. But they just they just want to show you something because yeah. they do it with their heart. Mm. This makes the difference. You come from a, a background of a, a clearly very diverse, but your claim to fame to start with, I think, was carbon fiber and your understanding of it and how to manipulate it and how it's applied to the helmet is really interesting because it's carbon in a look and layout that is different than any other helmet I've ever seen. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You have different materials mm -hmm. um, as carbon fiber. 
and you have the woven material, mm -hmm. the, the classical woven material yeah, we that we all know. And we typically will see, uh, like any carbon will be yeah. clear coated so you can yes. see the weave of yes. the carbon, but, yeah. but your carbon is not like this. It's not like that. Yeah. It's uh, the classical 3K or 6K fiber or even mm. 12K fiber. It depends on the, on the manufacturer and yeah. the development of the shell how the shell is is realized but and the next step would be a non-crimp fabrics mm -hmm. that doesn't make this angulations of yeah. the fiber so no weaves no weaves right and up and downs sure and the non-crimp fabrics is just a a layered material that is sewn together with a polyester thread or something yeah. like that. So because there's no weave, it, and they, the fibers lay flat against each other. And that's giving you much more performance. Mm -hmm. When you elongate a fiber, mm -hmm. then this means the first thing that you do is you take out the the curves. Yeah, the weave is... The weave. It's a straight line now. And, and then it comes to the force right. of the material it, like it that. created a bit of a marketing issue, didn't it? Because... It, the way you lay out the carbon is not terribly visually pleasing. It's much better performance-wise. You have to paint it. Yeah, you have to paint it. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's in, With the GS helmet, we used um, non-crim fabrics hmm. because this was an earlier development. Yeah, sure. But with the System 7, I just um, wanted to go one step beyond the, the, the known steps hmm. or the known the classical um, way to, yeah. to build up a helmet shell. And of course, the disadvantage is that you don't have visible zones yeah. with tra transparent coating. So we see them take these pieces of uh, like pre-cut carbon fiber, and mm -hmm. there's several of them, and they get put inside this sort of inverted helmet mold, yeah. right? And then they sort of get pressure cooked with uh, resin. Is that how it works? Mm -hmm. Well, um, the classical pre prep process, you, 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 you build up all the small cuts of the um, carbon fiber material yeah. into the shell and under pressure it's cooked in the oven for a certain with a certain process with a certain cycle yeah. this is just like you build up the formula one chassis or something like that it's, right. it's the same pro process it's absolutely the same yeah i remember um, seeing them take the helmet out of the form bring it over to have because of course you have now a solid helmet and there's no cutout for mm -hmm. the C and the in the, all the various bits of holes that go in to mount all the equipment and they put it inside this um, machine that used a water cutter it's a water jet yeah yeah and it, what was fascinating to me is the helmet sat on this form and it was this huge chunk of steel that the helmet sat on and there were holes burned through the steel from the water cutter yep. and and it just really shows you wow this thing really can cut just yeah. a stream of water. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think the pressure is something around about thousand bars or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Of all the processes of the helmet manufacturer, the one that seemed to that you were so excited to show us that was so fragile was applying the decals on the helmet because yeah. it, it they're so fragile. Yeah, it's. Um... You need a very, very steady hand and you just put the decal into water mm -hmm. and then you can take out the um, the film yeah, just like that and put it on the helmet. Yeah. And the problem is that you have to get rid of all the wrinkles. Right. But the decal in itself is super fragile. So when you press too hard, it just you just ruin the decal. Yeah. And it's not on a flat surface and either. It, you don't have a, um, a film that is combining the decal or holding it together. Yeah. The decal in itself, it's just sprayed coat. Mm. It's just sprayed coat holding together by, I don't know, but there is no film that the decal is applied on. And then you have to be aware that for the decal process, you have to take the helmet out of the coating process, you have a co coating line, mm -hmm. and when you have a monocolor helmet, mm -hmm. you do the base, yeah. send it by hand, then you put it into the coating line, mm -hmm. and the helmet shells are painted automatically. Yeah. And they just rotate, and they, they are sprayed, they, yeah. then they are coated automatically. And so you do the two, two times, you do the base color, yeah. And at the end, you do the transparent color. It can be shining or opaque yeah. or matte. Sure. But when you have the decal process, you have to do the base color, 
Ja. Then take the helmet out of the coating line. Then you applicate the coating. Right. Then you, it's not cooking, but drying. Yeah, sure. Drying all the, uh, all the decal on the helmet. And then you have to get back the helmet to the coating line for the transparent coating. Mm. So this means all the decals are underneath the transparent coating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was interesting for me, too, is that typically when I see a process of manufacturing, we see human hands will touch something and work with something. And then it goes into a machine and the machine sort of refines what they just did. But it was the opposite. You had... Um, components go into a machine to get work done and then human hands would take it out and do fine adjustments to get it just yeah. right. Yeah, you speak of the robot sanding. Mm. When it comes to very, very complex 3D shapes and mm. geometries like we have it in our helmets, Yeah, we can find it in our helmets because we don't want to limit our design Yeah. Just because it's easier in the further process. Mm -hmm. We don't do that. And so we you cannot work too much with the robot. Mm -hmm. And in these it was a approach of these days, mm -hmm. eight years ago. Yeah. But my feeling is that the work of the robot is more and more reduced, was more and more reduced. So we could not use the robot more and more. Yeah. We tried it on this level and yeah. then we got back to the manual sure. uh, operation process. Yeah. Just because it's so precise, the surfaces, and you can ruin a lot by sanding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From the point that you went from deciding it was time to develop a helmet to the point that you have a product in hand that can be um, sold, mm -hmm. how much time are we talking about here? Uh, three and a half years. Three and a half yeah, years. Three and a half years with a wow. lot of investigation here. Uh, we work together with around about seven designers. Mm -hmm. Right from the beginning of the project, we have at least seven persons, mm. project people at our partner. Sure. Yeah. And at various stages of the development process, you have various people involved in the project. For example, we have had with the System 7 four, three or four people in the aerodynamic, virtual aerodynamic simulation department, yeah. automotive department working for us. And just for, let's say, for four weeks or five weeks or six weeks. And then, of course, when we had the prototype helmet in our hands, even yeah. 3D print, <laughs> We we work together with the wind gallery experts. Mm -hmm. We organize the bikes to get in. in this, you have to get the slot for the wind gallery. This is quite wow. challenging yeah. because everyone wants to yeah. to be in the wind gallery. And okay, and so we tested the helmet sure. there, and then it switched from one one department to the next yeah. one. And the but the core team is always the same. Mm. Yeah. And you'd mentioned how important it is to integrate the helmet design into the design of the motorcycles. Does that mean that you have a say, like, can you go to them when they're designing a motorcycle and say, Hey, I love the bike, but I need you to make the windscreen a little different because it'll no. help. <laughs> <laughs> no, no It doesn't way. work that way. <laughs> It's like slaughtering the holy cow. <laughs> no, you don't have this power. Yeah. You can, you can just... You have to get along with the situation. Sure. And that's it. Yeah. And that's it. No, you have to adapt yourself with your helmet sure. uh, to the to the situation of the bike or something like yeah. that. But look, that you cannot just drive these people. Yeah. We uh, in the U.S. Um, we are often at the training department there at mm -hmm. BMW Corporate Zone, mm -hmm. and where they teach people how to work on cars. And they have an i3 there that's just the chassis, and it's all carbon fiber. Mm -hmm. And we always walk by it, and I point at it and say, Udo, yeah, yeah. that's Udo's design. That's yeah. Udo's carbon that's fiber. Not, it's not Udo's carbon fiber, but I worked, <laughs> I worked in this department. <laughs> no, let, let's keep it just Udo. Okay. I don't want to memorize all the names of the people. Uh, no, 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 no. Yeah. Udo. Yeah. <laughs> that's nice. So... Just for reference, we also want to bring up the fact you have been interviewed for Ride and Talk before. Yes. And you were on a sabbatical at the time. Yeah. Yes. After the System 7 project, I was quite exhausted. Mm. And because I've been in Italy nearly every week. Yeah. And I was, of course, even emotionally, in an emotional way, 
very, very much involved in the in yeah. the project. That's just my character. It's just my way of working. Sure. And sometimes I wish it would be different, but it is not. Yeah. Because it ex ex absorbs you enormously. Yeah. And for those of you listening, at the end of this podcast, we'll give you the episode number so you can listen to uh, okay, Udo, yeah. Pust, I think it's Udo, Udo Post System 7 Sabbatical. Yeah, yeah. It's, I think it's not System 7. It, it was not combined with System 7. It was just um, yeah. Luz de Esperanza in Bolivia, in La Paz. Yeah. But it's write and talk, I think, 41, mm. version 31. Yeah. yeah. Udo, you were in charge of more than helmets at BMW Motorrad, yeah? Mm -hmm. Is it okay if we come back again and talk of about course. some of these other products? Of course. Just because you're enthusiastic. I uh, very appreciate this. Of yeah. course, you know that we know since quite a lot of years and it's always nice to see you, to talk to you, and it's always just nice to get in contact. Yeah. yeah. We'll bring beer next time. Oh, we have beer. Don't worry about that. Oh. Oh. It's like bringing water to the, uh, to the, to the lake. <laughs> Or to the river, <laughs> like the Italians say. Yeah. You don't have to bring your beer with you. <laughs> don't forget about that. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're coming back. I think we should. Many times. Yeah. Udo, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with Thank us. Thank you. It was so super awesome. nice. Thank you, brother. Like always. <laughs> <laughs> big, big hug. <laughs> <laughs> we very much hope you have enjoyed this episode. We want to hear from you, so please rate, comment, and share your thoughts about this podcast. We have many more episodes on the way, so please subscribe, follow along, and share your requests for future episodes of the BMW Motorrad Ride and Talk podcast.